Carol, you have focused on two fascinating areas as far as I'm concerned. One is the universal theory of biology and what is life in an extraterrestrial sense. And another is the search and the um, exploration of anomalies as they're found in the field sciences or experimental sciences. So from those two poles, I just want to put to you some uh, questions that people talk about about the future uh, or, or unusual things. The first is transhumanism where the, the human beings will be changed in the future through the implementation, the, the implantation of, uh, of uh, electronics and uh, uh, enhancements of all kinds, genetic engineering, all different kinds of enhancements. Can, can those two areas of what you've understood about both life and anomalies help us at least to look to the long future about what transhumanism can be? So uh, I'm not sure what to say about that because um, I am skeptical, first of all, whether we'll survive the current bottleneck. <laughs> yeah, we'll assume we survive. Okay, right? yeah. assuming we survive, <laughs> right. which I think is a big assumption given climate change and also the threat of nuclear uh, annihilation, which I think is uh, more real than it's been for a long time. Um, but I'm also skeptical about this idea that we can so easily uh, add artificial intelligence to uh, human intelligence and successively create a unified uh, creature. Uh, so I would, I would think it would be more, if you're going to talk about artificial intelligence, I think it'd be more likely that we, for better or for worse, uh, create a new kind of creature that is a uh, machine and is intelligent, hopefully conscious. It's very difficult to tell. Well, why hopefully? Uh, well, it'd be nice that if we're going to create something, that it not only be uh, intelligent, but it also be in some sense self-aware. Um, I think those are different things. And I think that um, to have a fully sort of human-like intelligence, you're going to have to have self-awareness as well as uh, intelligence. Now, we might be able to create intelligences and machine intelligence that wasn't self-aware. I don't know what self-awareness is. Most philosophers don't. It's a real deep puzzle. Uh, among philosophers of mine. But, um, and I don't know how you could tell that you made a machine that was self-aware. Okay. I think you'd have mm -hmm. to just assume uh, that it was, uh, shall we say, sophisticated intelligence enough that it was probably self-aware. Mm -hmm. I, I can't be sure you're self-aware, although I make the, as <laughs> the assumption that you are. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the talk about transhumanism involves enormous number of assumptions that are not well established. Uh, whether or not we could mil meld our minds with some kind of artificial intelligence. I'm not sure that we can do that. Maybe we can, but I have my doubts. I would find it more plausible to think. And yet you're think. very comfortable of uh, thinking about different kinds of totally different life forms in other places of the universe. In fact, you've been a proponent of, of stretching your mind so that life is other places is not the same as life as it's here. But this is natural life, life that uh, basically arises from uh, chemistry uh, via prebiotic conditions and eventually uh, becomes uh, a form of uh, life that um, is able to do the kinds of things we do. So I think that's very different than constructing a machine and attaching it to, I mean, getting the machine connected with our wetware, yeah. or basically our minds, I think is going to be, or not our minds, but our brains is going to be a really challenging. No, sure, project. sure, on a practical yeah. matter. It's, and it's I'm not sure it's doable. Of, I mean, yeah, the question is yeah. whether it's, it, it, it's, it's what you can do in principle. I mean, we, there are some things you can do now. You have cochlear implants. Right. You have uh, certain types of uh, artificial eyes that can see. That's really uh, different, though, I think, than having the kind of uh, half person, half yep. human, half machine. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me that different in principle if you're looking for different, radically different forms of life naturally occurring versus creating it. Well, what, what's the fundamental difference? Well, we know that life can arise naturally. Ta-da! Right, right. <laughs> right. We don't know that these kinds of half machine, half human uh, forms are possible. And quite frankly, uh, artificial intelligence has been pretty disappointing. Uh, it's really good in expert systems, such as chatbot. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can get systems that are highly specialized that are really intelligent 
but they aren't, don't have the kind of general intelligence we have. So I'm just saying that we know that life did arise without any interference, we assume, unless there's some sort of space aliens we don't know about, naturally. And so I think those are different kinds of situations. But let me grant you, since you want this assumption, that this happened. Uh, these would be um, creatures of a very different sort, and it would depend how they were engineered. So it's very hard for me to uh, say what those creatures would be like. Um, I suppose you might want to say they'd be anomalies, um, but if they were actually engineered, there'd be some kind of theoretical basis for thinking it possible. So they wouldn't be anomalies in the sense in which I've been talking about anomalies, which are cases where we truly are ignorant about whether or not a system, say, is a living it, thing. Yeah, but it's kind of a reverse anomaly where you're re 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 uh, reverse engineering uh, uh, something to fit what could have been an anomaly. I mean, if you found one of these cyborgs or something out in the wild, uh, that would be an anomaly. Uh, it would be anomaly given our current understanding, but if, we, if, but if it were as technologically marked as, you think, as you're suggesting, that we could see that it was, shall we say, intelligent creature made, then I think uh, we wouldn't view it as an anomaly in the yes, same it's sense. It's you know what you might mean. If, obviously, if it had a, a, an Intel processor involved, or just, you, you would know that Yeah, it's, or just was half biological and half metal. Yeah. I mean, then well, you wouldn't think that it was something that arose maybe, maybe in a That's a life process. form in a different world. I mean, you, you know, you're the ones who's, but you wouldn't, who's... But there'd be very hard to explain how something like that could arise yeah. via non-technological right. means. So I think that in those circumstances, we would think it was a actually uh, a creation of a technological uh, intelligence. Talk to me for a minute about the, um, the the theory of anomalies you've had at, in the world of parapsychology, which is very controversial. Um, I'm not going to argue all the statistics uh, of it. I've seen all the sides of it. But can can your work with anomalies give any new insight into uh, the arguments whether parapsychology, ESP, and that whole world has any validity at all? So I'm happy to give you a positive answer this time. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the reason is because that's a phenomena that is natural. That is to say, we see it. Uh, people have reported experiences of ghosts and other things. It's surprising, actually, how many people have had such experiences and don't want to talk about it. It's a little mm -hmm. like so-called UFOs. A lot of people have had experiences there, you know, seen things and they don't want to talk about it. And the problem here is establishing that it's really an anomaly. And you can't do that unless you actually uh, concentrate scientific attention on the problem. As long as you say, oh, this is just too weird, so you saw it, uh, and somebody else claims to see it, but it's not really publicly accessible via like an experiment or like dragging somebody out to your field site and showing them, look, I found a new dinosaur bone. <laughs> the problem with parapsychology, and to a certain sense, UFOs, is that um, you don't have a way of taking the phenomena and freezing it so people can actually study it. It's very, they're very evanescent. They disappear almost as quickly <laughs> as you see them. And so I think you need to design technologies and take seriously the prospect and have scientists go out there and look at these phenomena. And the problem is the phenomena are not, you can't say, okay, we're gonna have this phenomena at 2.30 p.m. on you know, right. August 24th. Yeah. Everybody be there. It crops up and it disappears. So I think the I think some of these are anomalies, definitely. Uh, but there is a difference between taking a phenomenon which is unanticipated and unexpected and a potential anomaly, and establishing that it's a real anomaly. And I'm working with uh, Avi Loeb in the Galileo Project, uh, which is uh, investigating UAPs outside of government entities. It's full of scientists and um, uh, you know. Has, there's me, there's historians, there's scientists, there's engineers, there's AI people trying to actually figure out what they are. But first they have to design this very sophisticated equipment using multiple sensors because with one sensor it could be just an artifact. But with multiple sensors that decreases the prospect that it's an artifact. And then to put them in enough locations that, you're li that you are likely to actually mm. find it. And then 
you can analyze it. And I think that the same would be true of parapsychology, but nobody wants to do it. Young scientists, it could destroy their careers. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a real problem for a young scientists to go and explore something like this. So you need to have the money and the effort for people to actually take some of these cases where there's a lot of commonality. People report very similar things and then devise methods and tools for actually identifying it when it's encountered and photography and various other records and analyzing it further. And you'd be an advocate for doing that? I, w I would for cases where there's a lot of commonality among the, the sightings. <laughs> Because I think that I think that there's enough being reported in terms of certainly UFOs or UAPs that they're now called, and in parapsychology, that it's worth um, investigating further. But not all cases, and it's really hard to investigate it. It's not like Mars, which sits up there in the sky and is accessible to people to look at. Uh, these phenomena are very, as they say, fleeting, and they don't last very long. 